All right, chapter 12, we're starting to kind of get into our assessment sheets here. So we're looking at scene size up, which is you got BSI and then scene size up section of your assessment sheets. So for those of you that looked ahead on your blackboard and you already printed out your NREMT assessment sheets, this first portion is, falls under your medical and your trauma assessment sheets. You'll see at the top where it says scene survey, scene size up. All right. So some of the things that we're going to be talking about is violence towards EMS personnel. Um, basically, the major headings from the chapter um, in order is kind of what we're looking at here. So if you're following along in your book, you should be able to go through each one of these sections one by one and be able to follow along. The pre-hospital setting is a very uncontrolled environment. So with a good sense developed through experience and study, it becomes easier to recognize scene hazards. But Experience should never lead you to become complacent and let down your guard. Okay, the cost of failing to recognize these hazards of an unstable scene can be high for you, your partners, and your patients. So you got to make sure you pay very, very close attention the entire time that you're on the call, from the moment that you get it to your drive to the call, throughout the call, throughout the transport to the hospital. All right, all of that constantly. So you need to identify possible hazards of the scene and ensure your safety, the safety of other members. Always remember that the scene size up is a very dynamic and ongoing process that's going to continue throughout the call. Scene size up doesn't end after you contact the patient. Okay. Three basic goals. Identify hazards. Identify what led you to your being called to the scene and then determine whether any factors such as number of patients or unusual characteristics of the scene might require a call for additional assistance. Number one, take necessary standard precautions, what we call BSI, body substance isolation, to protect yourself against contact with blood and other bodily fluids and put any other ne necessary personal protective equipment on, such as gloves, eye protection, surgical mask, high efficiency N95 particulate mask for possible TB calls, gown, helmet, turnout gear. Evaluate the scene for safety. Right, is the scene safe? Do not enter until it's made safe. Protect yourself, your crew, your patient, and bystanders. Retreat, if necessary, till the scene becomes safe. Determine the mechanism of injury. Is the patient injured, a trauma patient, or ill, a medical patient? Okay or injured at all. Determine the mechanism of injury for a trauma and nature of illness for a medical. And is the MOI or NOI unknown at this time and unable to be determined until further assessment is done? Determine the number of patients that you have. Determine the need for additional resources, additional EMS units, possibly law enforcement, fire, has hazmat team for chemical or biological threats, do we need special rescue teams such as swift water, high angle surgical emergency rescue team, or any specialized research and extrication teams for a structural collapse? In a recent study published in pre-hospital emergency care, the authors found that 69% all right, of EMS personnel studied had experienced some form of violence over the preceding 12 months while providing EMS care. Verbal abuse was the most common, 67%, okay, compared to physical violence of 43%. All right, the types of physical violence include punching, slapping, or scratching, spitting, biting, being struck with an object, stabbing, or attempted stabbing, and shooting or attempted shooting. This is why it's important that you don't enter a safe until it's safe. Gloves are considered standard protective equipment, so wear examination gloves for every patient you suspect. We have them here in the building for you to use with every lab, and every truck has them on. So be sure you, before you go on service, you have an appropriate fitting glove. All right. The extent of standard precautions used to the application of other personal protective equipment varies depending on the suspected pathogen, anticipated exposure to blood or other bodily fluids. Some protective equipment that is needed. All right. In the hazardous zone may not be necessary outside of that area. For for example, a firefighter will wear full protective equipment to enter the burning structure to rescue a patient. The firefighter still wearing full protective equipment may deliver the patient to you in a staged area well away from the danger from the structure fire. And because you are working in a safe and protected environment, 
not an immediate hazard zone, it's not necessary to wear the same full protective equipment. If they fail to control the scene, the scene will control the EMT. So someone must be in charge. That someone might become the patient, a family member, or a crowd of bystanders, and the EMT fails to take charge. Sleeplessness, preoccupation with other problems, apathy, or overconfidence can lead an EMT to a shortcut to ignore the principles of scene safety. Don't let this happen to you. The consequences can be costly for patient, your partners, and yourself. Receipt of the call notification from the dispatcher can help you anticipate what standard precautions and other personal protective equipment you will need at a scene. So be aware of callers at times may deliberately give inaccurate information. For example, a caller may report chest pain when the problem is a stabbing or a gunshot wound. If the caller had reported the facts, it's likely that law enforcement personnel would also have been dispatched, something the caller wishes to avoid. So use the dispatch information and prepare for the scene, but remain alert that the scene may change when you get there. <clears throat> Angry, hostile patients, hazardous materials, infectious disease, crime scenes, down power lines, at any time during the scene size up, it may be necessary to recognize your own limitations and call for additional resources or specifically trained personnel to deal with the situation or rescue environment that beyond your training. At any time during the scene, all right, you may be necessary to recognize your own limitations and call for additional resources. Any injured or helpless EMT can't provide emergency care to a patient, so paying attention to that and resources may be diverted from the patient to the injured EMT, risking further compromise to the patient. So you must always be vigilant in your scene, carefully and determine whether, the safe, whether it is safe to approach the patient. This determination has to be made on all responses. Managing patients at crash scenes or on roadways or highways places the EMT at extreme risk of being struck by moving traffic. Take an extra precaution at crime scenes, suspected crime scenes, and scenes involving volatile crowd situations. Wait for the arrival of police. If a scene turns threatening, retreat and wait for the police. These scenes often include domestic violence calls. Be sure to bring your portable radio on every single call that you go. When you leave the ambulance so you can contact dispatch or medical direction from the scene for needed resources. All right, at a crash scene, all right, attention is always drawn naturally and immediately to the patients. This may put the EMT at considerable risk if the crash scene isn't properly controlled and safety precautions haven't been taken. All right. So you gotta think, you got a car, you got a broken telephone pole, you have some down power lines possibly. So you see how far away that they're staged, to be sure. All right, you want power company called in on this to make sure. This may put the EMT at considerable risk if the crash scene isn't properly controlled. Scenes that involve highly visible incidents, such as tanker spills, pipelines, heavy smoke conditions. All right, these are going to require highly specialized teams with more highly sophisticated and proper equipment than you have. So make sure you don't expose yourself to things like this until the proper people have come in to assess the situation. Crime scenes require special measurements to ensure that personnel, personal protection of the EMT. Some rescue scenes require specialized training and equipment. The EMT must be prepared to call on additional specialized resources to ensure not only his own well-being, but also the successful rescue of the patient. All right. Does jagged metal or broken glass pose a threat? Can such material be avoided? Are there any undeployed airbags? Is fuel leaking? All right. Is there an ignition source? Is there a fire? If rescue is possible, don't approach a burning vehicle directly from the front or the rear, where fire or explosion hazards are greatest, but from the side. Okay. Another source Serious threat to emergency medical or other rescue personnel at a crash scene is moving traffic. There are many well-documented incidents of EMTs being killed or severely injured by vehicles crashing into other emergency vehicles and emergency vehicles at a crash scene on a highway or roadway. Many well-documented incidents 
many. So make sure that you wear something that's highly visible. Make sure the vehicles are parked in a way in such that it protects you from collision. Using flares is important. Don't jump highway dividers to provide emergency care while leaving yourself exposed to moving traffic. All right. Reduce any unnecessary scene lighting that may distract or impair visibility on oncoming traffic. And you must always remain alert and take on many precautions, as many precautions as possible, necessary to make sure that you're not at risk being struck by moving traffic. Wear some sort of a certified reflective safety vest at the crash scene to make yourself highly visible, both day and night. Okay, you have to be prepared to call on additional specialized resources to ensure not only their own well-being, but also the successful rescue of a patient. Don't try to rescue a patient that needs higher level of skills than what you are trained to. The presence of ice can complicate any scene, making what would normally be a simple rescue hazardous. Avoid walking onto frozen ponds, lakes, or other bodies of water if you don't have the proper training. You're going to hurt yourself and then in turn injure the patient further. Okay, drownings, common reasons for dispatch of EMT team, but water can also be a factor in other types of calls. Always proceed with caution in situations where water is a factor. Rescue and moving water, such as rivers, streams, or creeks, presents the problems of open water rescue, but further complicates it because of the force of the current. So often a current makes swimming difficult or impossible sometimes. So patients and rescuers alike can easily be swept away even in shallow water. Never wade or walk into moving water in an attempt to rescue without adequate training and equipment. If an EMT's duty is to ensure the adequate numbers of appropriately trained and equipped personnel are summoned, if necessary, collapses in cave-ins such as buildings or construction sites, storage tanks and vats regardless of the contents, silos, bins at risk for suffocation hazards regardless of the contents, farm equipment such as combines or corn pickers or augers, all right, some special situations that EMTs might frequently encounter include those described. All right, victims of illness or injury may be encountered or unstable services or slopes. All right, they create a hazard. Access the, to the patient in such circumstances may require the use of ropes. If you're not trained in the proper use of these ropes in such situations, summon or wait for a trained rescue crew. Remember to secure the patient to the hillside to prevent him from sliding downslope during assessment, treatment, or stabilization. Be sure that vehicles have gone over embankments have been secured to prevent them from sliding carrying occupants and EMS personnel away. And beware of loose rocks that may be knocked down to your position by rescuers above. Drownings are big common reasons of an EMT team, but water can also be a factor in other types of calls. All right, so be cautious in these situations. Swimming pools present a major challenge for rescue of a patient. The patient will be visible, but to the EMT who is untrained in water rescue, retrieving the patient will be difficult and should never be attempted alone. The EMT's partner should be close at hand to lend assistance. A person floating, okay, can pose a risk. So a personal flotation device and a line or a pole to assist the rescuer at the pool's edge should be used. Okay, Rescue in open water is a specialized technique that requires training and equipment. The EMT must ensure that adequate resources are summoned when people have been reported as drowned or missing. Rescue in moving water presents the problems of open water further complicated by the force of the current as discussed before. So patients and rescuers alike can easily be swept away. You have to be alert to possible presence of toxic substances or areas of low oxygen during the scene size up. So some scenes, such as a crash involving a tanker truck, will present obvious hazards. At other scenes, the hazard may not be as obvious. For example, a call to aid someone who fell in their kitchen might present a toxic hazard. During the fall, the person knocked over a spilled bleach and ammonia combination of the two creates a chloramine gas, a lung irritant. Other highly toxic scenes that pose great risk for the EMTs are those involving chemical suicides. All right, People who invent, intend to, or commit suicide using a method often mix dangerous chemicals or release a gas such as propane in an enclosed space to asphyxiate themselves. Suspect the presence of toxic substances or an oxygen depleted atmosphere in the following circumstances, like scenes that involve highly visible incidents such as a tanker spill, pipeline ruptures, 
or heavy smoke conditions. Caves, wells, tankers, vats, manholes, sewers, culverts, underground utility vaults, silos, closed garages, and other confined spaces are areas where an EMT has to be very careful and use extreme caution. Such areas like these are low in oxygen and are high in toxic substances such as methane. Entry into a confined space should be made with somebody who has an appropriate SCBA in place, which is mostly the fire department or trained rescue teams. Many well-meaning rescuers have failed to recognize the risk of a confined space entry and have themselves become victims along with the patient they plan to rescue. So a toxic environment generally causes people within it to suffer from a similar symptoms. Okay, When called to the residence, which occupants exhibit similar signs and symptoms, assume that the environment is toxic until proven not to be. Faulty furnaces can cause such problems in the winter, but a blocked flue on a gas hot water tank can produce the same problem in a closed air conditioned residence at the peak of summer. Heat sources, cooking devices, bottles or containers, tubing, and other drug-making paraphernalia are also commonly found in these labs. You must be alert to the possibility of encountering such situations on every single call. If you're not trained to make the environment safe in such situations, you must contact specialized rescue or fire units who can. There will be times when you are sent to scenes at which no crime has been reported but where you suspect that a crime might be involved. A report of an injury at a bar late at night or a call in an area with a high crime rate might be suspect. Okay? Be alert to the possibility of danger on these calls. A dispatcher may not know that the scene at which they are directing you to, in fact, a crime scene. So while you're en route to such a scene, check to see whether police have also been called. If they haven't, maybe request that their support be en route to you. By arriving discreetly, you draw less attention to the scene and minimize the chances of drawing a crowd. Perform the scene size up. If the scene appears hostile or threatening, don't stop. Drive on and away for police backup. It's very important to park two or three houses away from the scene, giving you more opportunity to study the whole area before becoming involved. Especially at crime scenes in which guns might be involved, parking in such a position will usually put you outside the killing zone, the area which is controlled by the hostile fire. However, if someone inside the house has a gun in an area about 120 degrees in front of the house is at least partially exposed to fire. So the area can be much larger depending on the location of the house. And the killing zone isn't static and is always subject to change. Okay, is this scene chaotic? If so, don't allow yourself to be pulled into the chaos. Is the scene hysterical? Again, don't be pulled in. Does the crowd seem hostile to your presence? If it does, your options include retreating until appropriate backup arrives or taking the patient and leaving. Got to be alert to the possibility of the scene could suddenly turn dangerous. Okay, be prepared to retreat if it does. When approaching the scene, follow certain procedures. Walk on the grass. Okay not the sidewalk, for a quieter, less approach. If using a flashlight, hold it beside you, not in front of you, okay, so that you don't make your body a possible target. Okay, if you're walking with a partner, walk single file. The last person in the line should carry the jump kit. This will leave the person or persons at the front of the line encumbered and better able to react to any problem that might be encountered. Only the first person in the line should carry a flashlight because anyone with a flashlight behind the first person will backlight those in front. You'll see a silhouette, which is like a target on a range. So you don't want anybody shining a light behind you to illuminate your silhouette and be like, hey, I'm a target right here. As you approach the scene, note possible places of concealment and cover. Keep illuminating or scanning dark or shadowed areas for movement as you approach the house, take a moment to look at the windows and corners. If you need to take a longer look, change positions to make it harder for a hostile person to get a fix on you. Stand to the side of a door when you knock on it to avoid being a target for someone shooting through the door, springing out or reaching to grab you through the door. Standing to the knob side prevents a door that opens outward from blocking you. Okay. If the door opens inward, the person opening it will most likely be looking toward the hinge 
letting you see them before they see you. As soon as the door is open, assess the situation before you decide whether to retreat or call for reinforcement, or to have your partner move the ambulance up to the front of the building. As you enter, leave doors open behind you to ensure an escape route. Likewise, never appear to block the patient's route of escape. When you're at the patient's side, your first priority remains protecting yourself and your partner. The next priority is to protect and treat the patient. If you reach a patient and discover that a perpetrator may still be on the scene, then police intervention will be necessary. Ensure that the police have been called and follow local protocols and be ready to retreat. Limit the number of responders at a possible crime scene to the number required to care for the patient. Don't allow bystanders to touch or disturb the patient or their immediate surroundings and introduce yourself to the patient and say that you're here to help them. Crime victims are often confused and fearful of contact with strangers, so be alert to their possibility that the patient is at the crime scene may not be simply a victim but also a perpetrator. Always keep in mind the patient's hands in a hostile situation. All right, Be prepared for the possibility that such a patient may also reach for a weapon. If possible, have one EMT keep a constant watch on the bystanders and the surrounding area while you work on the patient to alert you if a scene begins to turn dangerous. Work together as a team. Remember, as you work on the patient, that your task is to render medical assistance and to save their life, not to aid in solving a crime. Be as considerate of the police requests as possible, but keep in mind your primary task, which is medical care and treatment of that patient. Where appropriate, assist police in collecting and recording anything on the patient, such as blood, hair, seminal fluid, gunpowder residue, or clothing fibers, and follow your local protocols. Take extreme care not to disturb the evidence that's not directly on the patient's body, such as footprints, soil, broken glass, tire tracks, and so on. Never touch or move suspected weapons unless it's necessary for treating the patient's injuries. Many guns found are loaded and extremely dangerous to handle because of the possibility of accidental discharge. Such a gun in the hands of an untrained person could pose an extreme hazard to you, your partner, the patient, and other bystanders. If you do touch a weapon, do not disturb any fingerprints All right, that may be on it. Pick up a gun at the edge of the grip and use gauze pads to pick up a knife at the very edge of the blade. Wear gloves the entire time on your scene to avoid leaving your fingerprints at the scene. If you need to tear or cut away clothing to expose a wound, make sure you don't cut through bullet holes or knife slashes in the clothing. Keep the clothing and submit it as evidence to the police. If possible, one EMT can keep a constant watch on the bystander and the surrounding area while you work on the patient and alert if you have a scene begins that turns dangerous. If the patient was strangled or tied with a rope or other material, cut at the point away from the knot instead of untying it. The knot can be used as evidence and may help identify the perpetrator. And If the patient is responsive, do not burden them with questioning about the crime. And that's not your job. Again, we're there to treat the patient, not solve a crime. Realize that the patient will probably show extremes of emotion and be prepared to handle them. Document who's at the crime scene when you arrive. If a patient is obviously dead when you arrive, do nothing and disturb nothing. Summon the police if they haven't already been called and wait for their arrival. However, remember that you must provide basic life support and other appropriate care as you would for any patient unless injuries are so extreme or the patient has obviously been dead for so long that resuscitation is out of the question. Using a flashlight, hold it beside you, not in front of you, okay, so that you don't make yourself a target, such as you see here. Make the person in front hold the flashlight. The person in the back, like discussed before, hold the bag. This allows the person in front to handle situations up front and first, all right? If you're walking with a partner, walk single file. If you're approaching a door, notice that both of them are standing to the side of the door. Most people generally, when they knock, they stand in front of the door. Somebody who wants to do harm will shoot through the door knowing that somebody's standing directly on the other side. So don't make yourself a target. All right, so some scenes, alcohol, drugs may, may be involved. 
so your eyes can require several minutes to adjust from a bright to low light.